Recently, I was having a conversation with some friends of ours who were over at our house. And the conversation turned in the direction of questions around church and church rhythms. Can't exactly remember how this came about, but just it's one of the job hazards of being a pastor. But it, through the conversation, we talked about how for those early Christians, especially as worship moved out of the synagogue and into other spaces of gatherings, especially homes, the day of worship for these early Christians shifted from Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath day, to Sunday. Because Sunday was understood as the day Jesus arose. So every time they gathered together for worship, it was a way of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus in their lives. For us today, I feel like we've by and large lost that element for each worship that we engage in. But part of our church calendar includes not just Easter Sunday, but a whole season known as Easter time goes from the Easter Sunday to the day of Pentecost, and it's the season of Easter. So we don't just celebrate Easter on one singular day, but it's a season, and it pushes us to reflect on Jesus and how Jesus' resurrection comes to bear in all areas of our lives. In that spirit, for the next six weeks here at First Baptist, we'll be spending our time in the book of First John exploring the way the author encourages those early believers to open themselves up to the new life Jesus brings. As we begin our journey through 1 John, I want to spend just a minute with some background information that help, is helpful to guide us through our journey in this book. First, John seems to be writing to a group of churches that he has a close association with because there had crept into that community some beliefs that he wants to correct he wants to reorient those followers of Jesus that he writes to back to the person and work of Christ. Without getting too deep in the weeds, this group believed that Jesus wasn't actually a physical human being, that he only appeared to be, that he was a spiritual being and only appeared to take on flesh and bones. So they put so much emphasis on this spiritualness and spiritual experience that they actually devalued the physical, earthly realm. Some even claiming that because sin was something of this earthly realm, of the physical nature of life, that they were so spiritual that they didn't and in fact couldn't sin. And to both of those ideas, John is like, no, 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 no. He even starts his letter off with saying, what we told you, what we testified to, was not just some spiritual experience. Jesus wasn't just some spiritual being. These were the things that we heard we felt, we saw with our eyes, we touched with our hands. Jesus, whom John calls the eternal life that was with the Father, John says, became knowable and a real flesh and bones person. And John is like, we can't devalue this physical existence because God didn't when Jesus came and took on flesh. And therefore, our actions and our behaviors here on earth deeply matter. Secondly, John's chief concern for those believers to whom he is writing is to remind them of the vital importance of living in fellowship with God and with one another. John uses the word multiple times in these first few verses, the Greek word koinonia, to introduce this idea. And koinonia is a Greek word that is often translated community or fellowship, and it has at its core element a deep, intimate, emotional connection between people who are joined together by common commitments and common beliefs and shared practices and common values. And he doesn't want them to be deceived and led astray by anything that would end up endangering this koinonia with God and with each other. Throughout the book, the language shifts a little bit, as we'll see in the coming weeks. John uses the language of being children of God, of being born of God, of abiding in and with God. But all of that language is to point to the vital importance of the believers experiencing this life-giving, life-sustaining, uniting and transformative fellowship with God. And through that commitment, sharing that same fellowship with one another. And this theme pushes John to encourage believers to adopt certain perspectives Perspectives about God, perspectives about the world, perspectives about themselves, and as well as to encourage them to engage in certain practices 
that open ourselves up, open themselves up to the transforming power and healing of God. And for today, I want to focus in on the practice that John invites his readers to participate in in order to experience the healing mercy of God, the practice of confession. John says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Of all the practices we might engage in to grow in our fellowship and communion with God, confession might just be the most difficult to live out. And I think it's difficult for many reasons. On the one hand, confession is difficult because we fear what people would think of us if they really knew everything about us. We all have those parts of our lives that make up our shadow selves, the parts that we hide and maybe try to ignore because we don't really like them. They are the sins, the struggles, the traumas, the hurts, the pains of our lives that influence our decisions and behaviors in ways that we know and can see, as well as in ways that we don't know and can't see. But we don't bring those into the light because we're afraid of what people would think. Because we've spent so much energy and time presenting an image of ourselves for those around us. And we fear what they might think if they find out that that image we present isn't completely who we are. So we hide. We hide that part of ourselves from others. And even though we know that in the back of our minds that it is futile and silly, we don't bring that to bear in our relationship with God. Confession is also difficult because we don't like facing those darker parts of ourselves. We don't like facing our own mortality and sinfulness and brokenness. We don't like thinking about ourselves in that way. We want to think of ourselves as people who can overcome any challenges. And we're so wrapped up in the American narrative that we can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps that coming to the end of ourselves and turning around to come face to face with our own shortcomings is hard and difficult. So why confession? If it's so difficult, why is this the path that John encourages us to walk? A few thoughts. First, when we confess, we confess that we might grow in our understanding of the character of God. Notice the way John speaks about God beginning in verse 5. John says, God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and we are cleansed from all sin. God is not a God of darkness, but rather a God of light. Now, John isn't talking about this idea in a kind of esoteric sense, or like when we turn the lights on in our house or in this building that God is there in the light. But rather, John uses this metaphor in an ethical sense. God is light, and light is associated with living in obedience to the way of Christ. And it's not possible to claim to be in the fullness of fellowship or koinonia with God and constantly and continually walk in disobedience to God's way. And the answer for this way of life is not to hide it, but for John, the answer is to bring that darkness into the light so that it might be seen for what it is and redeemed. God is light, and confession brings that light to bear on all those dark spaces of our lives. And therefore, we should confess. But notice also in verse 9, John declares that if we confess that God is faithful, that God is just, and that we find forgiveness and hope for cleansing. If we constantly hide our brokenness, hide our sins, hide our failings, then we will never fully experience these elements of God's character. For example, my wife, Ellie, some of you might not know, she danced all throughout her life growing up, even majored in ballet for three years at Friends University where we met at school before switching to an English degree. So before meeting Ellie, I never once went to a ballet. I know that's shocking. 
I never dreamed of going to a ballet. I never hoped that one day I would be a regular attender at the ballet. It was just something that was not on my radar. It was not a part of who I was. But ballet is a big part of who Ellie was when I first met her and continues to be a part of who she is today. So what would happen if I never went to the ballet with my wife? I would be cutting myself off from an important part of who she is. And so early on in our dating life, I went to my first ballet with her. Not so much because I wanted to go, but because it was a way to get to know her in her fullness. And as it turns out, I could use a little more culture in my life. <laughs> if we never came before God in confession and our relationship with him halted at surface level, then we would never be honest about who we truly are. And we would never experience the fullness of who God is. The complete depths of God's faithfulness and righteousness and forgiveness towards us. So we confess because it opens all of who we are to all of who God is. And that is the only path to full fellowship, full koinonia with God. We also confess because what we attempt to keep in the dark, what we attempt to keep secret, in the end has the most power over us. And confession is the path towards freedom and healing. The problem with keeping things in the dark is that then we begin to live out of our shame and guilt. And it is impossible to live a life, a full life, in fellowship with God or with one another when we are guided by shame and guilt. We will never make our best decisions when we are being guided by shame and guilt. And when we are living out of this sense of shame and guilt, it's so easy for us to believe the lies that we are not worthy. And shame and guilt has that power to cut us off from hope. And when we are cut off from hope, it is so easy to continue in our sin, continue in our brokenness, continue in the destructive behaviors because we can't see anything different in our future. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian who's one of my favorites in his book Life Together, speaks about the importance of confession and the power of sin in this way. And it's a long quote, so bear with me. He says this, Sin demands to have a person by themselves. It draws them from community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over them. And the more deeply they become involved in it, the more disastrous is the isolation. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. In confession, the light of the gospel breaks into the dark and seclusion of the heart. The sin must be brought into the light. The unexpressed must be openly spoken and acknowledged. All that is secret and hidden is made manifest. When confession of sin is made in the presence of a Christian brother or sister, the last stronghold of self-justification is abandoned. The sinner surrenders. They give up all their evil. They give their heart to God and finds the forgiveness of all sin and the fellowship of Jesus Christ and their brother or sister. In the act of confession, we open ourselves up to the fullness of God's healing power. We lay aside any self-justification that we might bring. And we open and lay bare all of who we are. And in doing so, we remember the truth that we are never out of God's reach. In fact, John even reminds his readers that if we do sin, in the second chapter, he starts out, and when we find ourselves caught in darkness of sin and shame and guilt, we have an advocate, that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, unless we think that it's only about us, not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Even in the darkest moments of sin and shame, Jesus is there, offering redemption calling us beloved and offering hope for healing and the forgiveness he brings. Why confession? It opens all that we are to the fullness of God. And if we're ever to experience the healing power of Christ, we have to break that power of sin and shame and guilt by bringing it into the light. Finally, in that book, Life Together, Bonhoeffer says that when we confess, a breakthrough happens. He says we break through to community. 
that we break through to the cross, that we break through to new life, and we break through to the certainty of God's grace. While confession can certainly occur in the silence of prayer to God alone, Bonhoeffer actually encourages believers to confess not in silence to God, but also to another believer. And he encourages this for many reasons. When we confess in silent prayer to God, we can still operate in a sense of hiddenness from our larger community. When we confess to God alone, we can still keep our pride intact and not have to come face to face with the humility that comes when others know of our brokenness and sinfulness. When we confess in silence, we might never know if we are truly receiving God's grace or if we are just absolving ourselves of our own sins. But in confession to another, we experience the breakthrough to community as we live authentic and openly before others. We experience the breakthrough to the cross as our pride, which Bonhoeffer says is the source of all sin, is broken as we bring our sins to the light. We experience the breakthrough to new life as we give up all to follow Christ. The sin's dominion is broken, and we live into that new resurrection life that Jesus promises to give. And we break through to certainty as our brother or sister represents God in proclaiming forgiveness and grace over us. We confess to open all of who we are to all of who God is. We confess so that shame and guilt's power is broken. And we confess so that we can break through to the resurrection life God has for us. Often when I am writing my sermons in public spaces, like a coffee shop or maybe sometimes the library, I put in headphones and listen to Christian music as I write. And as I did that this week, I came across this song that I had never heard before, but it gets to the heart of what we're talking about this morning. The song is by an artist named Sarah Kroger, and it's entitled Belovedness. And I'm going to, I want to speak and, and give you a picture into the lyrics of the song, because it is beautiful. So bear with me and listen. You've owned your fear and all your self-loathing. You've owned the voices inside of your head. You've owned the shame and reproach of your failure. It's time to own your belovedness. You've owned your past and how it's defined you. You've owned everything everybody else says. It's time to hear what your father has spoken. It's time to own your belovedness. God says, you're mine. I smiled when I made you. I find you beautiful in every way. My love for you is fierce and unending. I'll come to find you, whatever it takes, my beloved. You've owned the mess you see in the mirror. You've owned the lies that you're just not enough. You've been so blinded by all you're comparing. It's time to own your belovedness. God says, you're mine. I smiled when I made you. I find you beautiful in every way. My love for you is fierce and unending. I'll come to find you whatever it takes, my beloved. You are completely loved and fully known. Beloved, believe he died to make your heart his home. It's time to own your belovedness. Through confession, we open ourselves up to the fullness of God's character we break the power that sin and shame has when we keep things in the dark. And we break through to community, to the cross, to the new life of Christ, to the certainty of God's grace. And the final step of confession is owning the truth that we are fully known and fiercely loved by God. Brothers and sisters, that is who we are. That is who you are. It's who I am. As we confess our sins and our brokenness, may we accept that truth. We are God's and forever held in God's fierce and never-ending love. Amen.